When there is an ending, there was a beginning. Every victim has a picture to paint. Every true crime has its time and place. Please join our MJ podcast, the series Deep Into the Woods, Missing Persons, Unsolved Crimes, and the Does. Welcome to our MJ Podcast, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer, Episode 8, Part 6, The Unsolved Murder of Hazel Drew. My name is Mark, and I will be your host for tonight's show, and joining me later will be our co-host, Miss Callie. We are coming to you from our office in Plattsburgh, New York. It's the curious details of murder uh, of a murder case that grips a true crime investigator. Some have elements that are violent, bloody, gruesome, and unsettling. Even worse, some murders remain unsolved, meaning that the perpetrator disappeared into the night after the deed was finished. Who killed Hazel Drew? The little known 1908 murder case that inspired the TV hit series Twin Peaks. We all have that story. The story that haunted and intrigued us as children. 
the story that opened us up to a different world, to the darkness that many of us still seek out in true crime. Twin Peaks, the bizarre and brilliant whodunit from the early 1990s, returned in 2017 to mystify a whole new generation of television viewers. The show centers on a small town murder of Laura Palmer and the secrets that surface in the wake of her death. As it turns out, the fictional mystery of Palmer's death can be traced back to a 1908 real-life murder case. Peace co-creator stated the show was loosely inspired by a certain story his grandmother used to tell him as a child while he spent summers with her in rural New York, a place called Sand Lake. The inspiration sprang from a nightmare bedtime story his grandmother planted in his ear as a young boy. The grandmother told him that a ghost haunted the area of the lake close to where they live. Known locally as the Teal Pond Mystery, this ghost story comes from a real murder of a 20-year-old woman named Hazel Drew on July 7, 1908. On July 11, 1908, Hazel Drew's body was found washed ashore. The 20-year-old female was found with a corset string wrapped tight around her throat, and her death was caused from blunt force trauma to the back of the skull. Her gloves had been folded neatly and placed 20 feet from the shore alongside her straw hat which was decorated with a pen with the letter H. Thereafter children were warned not to venture into the woods at night for the nights were haunted by the ghost of murder victim Hazel Drew whose killer has never been brought to justice. Hazel Drew was last seen alive in the town of Sand Lake, New York on the evening of July 7, 1908, picking raspberries at the side of the main road. This image of innocence was shared by her community and so what was to follow would come as an enormous shock. The 20-year-old body was found floating on July 11, 1908, at Teal Pond, yet no water was found in her lungs, suggesting she had not drowned. At the time of Hazel Drew's death, no one knew that Hazel had a vibrant, chaotic, personal life. It was late on the night of July 3, 1908, when a Desperate, Hazel Drew arrived at the door of a dressmaker. The door had barely opened and Hazel began to explain that she had weekend plans to go to Lake George, New York in the Adirondack Mountains. Hazel Drew was holding a fold of new fabric and was pleading with the dressmaker to make her a new shirt waist. The dressmaker took the new material from Hazel and set it in her sewing machine and made the shirt waist Hazel so desired. It was now after 11 p.m. The 20-year-old Hazel Drew's plans would later dramatically change. The late night session with her dressmaker 
would become the first in a chain of bizarre weekend events. That would end with Hazel's body being found floating face down in Teal's pond wearing the so desired shirtwaist. Hazel never went to Lake George. Instead, the 20 year old spent the weekend with her aunt and without notice, and Drew quit her job that Monday morning. Hazel wasted no time. She packed her travel trunk and with her suitcase in hand, she disappeared. For two mysterious days, Hazel traveled. Hazel told her aunt she was going to visit friends, but she didn't. She was spotted briefly at Troy's Union Station and spoke to a friend who she told she was meeting someone, but the friend left with no clues to who Drew was meeting or where she spent Monday night. Hazel had for some months been living a very secretive life, buying tailor-made clothes and taking numerous trips to New York City, Boston, and Providence, Rhode Island. One of the most important questions looming over the investigation was how could she afford these luxuries on a salary of a domestic worker, her wages as a governess? It doesn't add up. The 20-year-old Hazel Drew had no known boyfriends. But after her murder, police uncovered a great deal of correspondence between Hazel Drew and several different men. A lot of what authorities had to go on were the initials of those people Hazel had been meeting in the night or writing to in secret. The evidence showed that Hazel Drew lived a complicated double life, which every lead announced by police a new character was added to the tapestry of suspects. Let's take a pause for the cause and we will return with cases from the deep freezer. This is episode 8, part 6, The Unsolved Murder of Hazel Drew. MJA would like to give a special shout out to Shiloh's Restaurant, located at 202 Central Street in Woodsville, New Hampshire. MJA and groups like ours have eaten there several times. The food is excellent and they serve alcohol. The service is class A and the prices are fair. It has great atmosphere and it's kid friendly. Once again, that's Shiloh's Restaurant, located in Woodsville, New Hampshire. Please check it out. So 
Welcome back to our MJ podcast, the series Cases from the Deep Freezer, Episode 8, Part 6, The Unsolved Murder of Hazel Drew. There were no shortage of suspects. There was Frank Smith, a farmhand Hazel had known, but he was queered with an alibi. Then came Hazel's uncle, William Taylor. Taylor lived within a mile of the lake where Hazel's body was found. William Taylor was there to help pull Hazel Drew's body from the water. Though the town found Taylor a prime suspect because of his odd behavior, Taylor was known as suicidal and melancholy. William Taylor was eventually cleared as they could find no evidence linking him to Hazel Drew's death. There was another local man known as Halfwit who was said to torture animals, as well as a professor said to have employed the 20-year-old Hazel Drew. Hazel's mother also mentioned a man from Troy, New York, who she believed possessed hypnotic powers. The the suspicious characters kept coming. A dentist that proposed to Hazel Drew. A train conductor she may have been dating in secret. A local millionaire, Henry Cramroth, who ran a near by club resort with an illicit reputation. There were rumors of orgies and women being held against their will swirled around the resort, as well as rumors about Hazel Drew's romantic involvement with Cramroth. Cramroth was also left off of the suspect list by police. This is despite witness Witnesses claiming to have heard screams from his establishment around the time of the murder. New York Evening World, July 29, 1908. Troy, New York, July 29, 1908. New witnesses in the Drew murder case. Detectives Powers and Unzer reported to District Attorney O'Brien that they had found two new witnesses. These witnesses is expected to shed light on the mysterious murder of Hazel Drew. The 20-year-old Drew's body was found in Teal's Pond. One of the witnesses is known to be Willie Drew. This is the little brother of the dead Hazel Drew. Willie Drew at the time of the murder was staying at a farmhouse of Mrs. Libby Sowalski on Bear Road about two miles from Teal's Pond. The other witness is Mrs. Sowalski's son who is big, a big 20 year old. He is regarded as being somewhat lacking in intelligence. Young. Sawalski was questioned closely by detectives. He will be one of the first witnesses called when the inquest into Hazel Drew's death is resumed. The detectives told O'Brien they had learned enough during their investigation to convince them that Hazel Drew was bound for the Sawalski home to see her brother on the night of the murder, which was July 7, 1908. The murder of Hazel Drew is still officially unsolved. It seems to be a short-lived kind of investigation conducted by police. You can safely say Hazel Drew wasn't from a prominent family and there was very little sympathy for female victims of the sort in this time. The Drew murder investigation may have gotten the short end of the stick. Superfans flocked to Sand Lake, New York after an announcement of Twin Peaks return in 2017. 
The community is used to people poking around the woods near the lake. They are hoping to piece together what happened to Hazel Drew, who served as an inspiration for one of the most iconic victims in television and cinema history, Laura Palmer. Nowadays, Sand Lake is a quiet residential area, but in 1908 was a booming summer holiday spot packed with tourists. Hazel Drew is buried at Brookside Cemetery in Potsonskill, New York. Let's take a pause for the cause, and when we return, our co-host, Miss Callie, will join us. This is the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. Be back in a moment. This is an MJA Inc. Investigations Warning. This MJA podcast is rated E for explicit. Some details of a case and language used on this podcast might be upsetting to some of our listeners. Listeners' discretion is advised. And for those who are still with us, kick back and enjoy the show. Welcome back to our MJ podcast, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. This is Episode 8, Part 6, The Unsolved Murder of Hazel Drew. Joining us on the line is our co-host, Miss Callie. How are you tonight, Miss Callie? I'm great, Mark. You? I'm just fine. Uh, did you good. Did you ever watch the TV series Twin Peaks back in the 1990s? No, I didn't. I was too busy working. I never saw it. 
Okay. And I I can't get it on Netflix, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. After I had watched this series on TV and on Netflix, I already knew that some of the murder facts for the TV series came from a real-life murder case. When I moved up here to the Adirondack Mountains in 2002, I mm -hmm. googled unsolved murder cases around the area, and the unsolved murder of Hazel Drew popped up. There, there are a lot of unsolved and solved murders in the Adirondack Mountains and outside the areas leaving the mountains. Isn't it kind of strange that this case happened in 1908 and the victim, Hazel Drew, was only 20 years old? Even today, about the average age for a female victim in this type of crime is around 20 years old. So. Do you find that kind of strange that the statistics also was good in 1908? Not really, because uh, there's a lot of things, even going back to Jack the Ripper, and, and you can go back a lot further, that humans, we may have changed our, our ways as far as like what we have, materialistic things, but... Um, the spirit of murder, it, it, you know, even back to Cain and Abel, it's the same. It hasn't changed. And, Miss Callie, since the 20-year-old Drew was found on the shore of Teal Pond, do you think it could have been a meeting place? I don't know. I It could have been, but I doubt it. Um... The first thing I think of is mosquitoes. <laughs> and I can't imagine that being very comfortable uh, as a meeting place. Um, so, especially, you know, it's July um, at the height of the season for mosquitoes. So, no, I think that she was taken there, but that's my opinion. Okay. And also, you must remember, no water was found in her lungs, meaning she didn't drown. It's more than likely that the blunt force trauma occurred around the pond, and then she was thrown in the pond. Do you think the perp, how do you think the perp got her to Teal Pond? Well, you mentioned the blunt force trauma coming from Teal Pond, but I don't really go with that uh, because of the corset string that was used on her neck. Um... It would seem like it was an intimate occurrence, like something to have someone's corset string, unless it's your own, around someone else's neck. It's just not, it just doesn't correspond with being at a lake. It doesn't correspond with, or at a pond. Um, it, it shows that it was an intimate occasion or at least an intimate, known intimate person to her, um, that she knew the person. Um, but I don't, I don't believe that she got hit in the head there. Okay. Okay, and do you find it critical to have the case, in order to solve the case, you have to find some of the victim's secrets. Do you agree with that? Oh, yes. I mean, you have to know the comings and goings and the whys and the wheres and the whats. Um, what is it they say, 72 hours, right? Yes. Prior. Um, th those hours are very valuable because you don't, it, if you don't know the, the, the geography of what the person was doing, thinking, or being prior to their demise, then... You can't fit a puzzle together because you don't have those ingredients. You just can't do it. It's a given that the 20-year-old Hazel Drew was leading a double life. So how would you start weeding out which life could have gotten her killed? Well, um, I think it was her other life, her contact with money. Her real life actually was uh, 
one life was starting to take over the other. She was she quit her job. She had uh, without any warning, she just up and quit, and uh, she seemed to have money, and she was hedging forward from being, you know, the house servant or the, the working for, for other people, like, what was she planning to do? You know, there's no, there's no information for that, but there's things that can kind of draw it together. And do you think each trip that Drew took had some type of meaning? Yeah, I think she was either... I have listened to a few things on this, on her um, disappearance and the correlation with Twin Peaks and so on and so forth. But um, I kind of think that she'd been drawn, because she didn't come from a lot of money, um, she was kind of drawn to it and that uh, she was probably reimbursed for her trips, whether they be to... Um, like an escort service, uh, but the person back at uh, where she was murdered in, in that area, was that called Troy or Twin Peaks, by the way? No, it's, what actu is it's actually ca uh, called, um, uh, well, I got it right here. It happened in... Um Okay. Sorry about that. I just, I. That's okay. It happened in. Um, well, it happened in Sand Lake, New York. Okay, Sand Lake. Yeah. Well, anyway, I think whoever was uh, introducing her to this life of money uh, was back in Sand Lake and so she would go off whether it was to be an escort or or to uh, uh, retrieve other females back to Sand Lake or to you know uh, get drugs and bring them back not sure about the latter I'll explain that later so well, the latter about the drugs, most in 1908, a lot of the drugs was legal. That was before the Narco Narcotics Act. Yeah, but they may not have had them that handy right there in Sand Lake. Yeah. Yeah. You mean you may have had to get a prescription for some of them. Yeah. I don't know if you could get a prescription for heroin back then or morphine. I, I'm not I'm sure you could. Even though it was said she didn't have a boyfriend, do you think it's possible she was meeting men during these trips? Oh yes, I think so. But I don't think, uh, like I said, the main um, character, male character, will have been in at Sand uh, Sand Lake. She said. Yeah. Well, yeah. I believe he was there, and yeah. Okay. And there's been many questions about how she lived her life. So how do you think the 20-year-old Drew was able to afford such luxuries as trips and such in 1908? Like I said, I think she was being, actually, I think someone was being a pimp, if you want to put it in modern-day terms, okay. and that she was being uh, exploited uh, sexually for purposes and paid uh, whether it be just in the trips or um, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that she was being being uh, treated. Let's put it that way. And do you think the millionaire, Cramroth, had more to do with Hazel Drew's finances? I do. I do. It's kind of like this. I uh, went through the whole, like, who could have done it and all that. And yes, you get one flower at a time. But if you bring things together to make a bouquet, I know that's kind of, I don't know how else to put it together, but 
you have to have, you know, a great number of things that go together to create that. You can't just have one. And it just seems like a lot of the people that were mentioned in the past or in other parts that um, don't have it as having the several things that go together. And he seemed to have it all. And it has been said that Hazel Drew had dirt about the club resort that Cramroth owned and operated. Do you think it's possible she was blackmailing him? I don't know. Um, she might have been, but I, I really think she's naive. I really think she's just a naive person. Um, she um, came from this background where she'd never experienced anything like this which most of us haven't and she had you know like this money the 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 buildings the lifestyle the whole thing and she's so naive she be- I think she believed he loved her and that this was going to be more than just her um trying to please him and doing all these things and of course getting into a lifestyle that she liked and that lifestyle was about the money and about the the things that and she I think over compensated like almost like a fantasy that he loved her um, a little irrational and her naivety would have allowed her to go there with that and due to all the suspects do you yourself see a top suspect on your list? I guess I answered that already, yeah. Yeah, I think it's Cram... Is it Cramworth or...? Cramroth? Yeah. Cramroth, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think he's my number one go-to. Okay. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but some of these suspects look to be victims of a female con game, and then some look to be clients but never having the defined meaning of just business clients or sexual clients. Living a double life, it's hard to define a lot of things. Miss Callie, what kind of game do you think the 20-year-old Hazel Drew was playing? Well, I, I don't think she was. I think that TV series made her into a... Like, they glamorized and and pumped up these things more so than what they wear. I think that she just, she wasn't playing a game. She really believed it. She believed that, you know, and and in these men, well, they weren't her uh, love ob- objective. Um, they wouldn't want to take any responsibility of their own to what they've done with, with her. Um, sexually, but they would be okay with saying that she was playing them. And that's kind of how it played out on, on Twin Peaks. So I, I don't believe that's a reality. And do you find it odd that the 20-year-old Drew was a lot wiser than being 20 years old? No, I don't believe that, though. I don't believe she was. I think she was very, very, she led a very sheltered life up until she was introduced to all these things, and she just, um, it was kind of like being, uh, coming from, I, I don't know, from poverty, basically, to having everything, and not understanding that this person's intentions towards you are not what you think they are like I don't think she had any clue about that and do you find it odd there are no stories of these different men running into each other or even knowing each other well they all might have known each other but like the ones in not specific in Sand Lake area but I, I don't think any of the ones where she went off to these other places would have known each other. And I I don't think men kind of sat around and talked about um, 
Oh, maybe they did. I don't know, but I can't imagine that they uh, conversed about what they had done with her. And do you think that you could use the info to your advantage? Well, if they had talked, sure you could. And and uh, if they had things to say. Sometimes people say things, though, to cover things up. So, I mean, how are you going to... You c you could filter it, yeah, you could try. But you have to watch out for the people who take advantage of that situation. And, you know, say, well... She she was at a certain place at a certain time, and she wasn't. You know, like you can't you can't trust that. And on July seventh, nineteen oh eight, what do you think happened to twenty year old Hazel Drew? Well, I think that well, she had packed a trunk and a suitcase, and she had gotten a waistband made and picked raspberries. Now, very odd scenario, <laughs> especially at night. I don't know how you pick raspberries at night. Well, um, it was like, but, it, the way it was explained, it was um, uh, the sun was just going down. Oh, well, that's not too bad then. Um, I kind of was like, how does that work? And I suppose women at that time wore their hats day and night. Um, when they were out and about. Um, but anyway, let's go back to that. Um, okay. I believe she was murdered in a well-to-do building, a house or whatever, and that she had gone to her lover, the person she believed loved her, now, there was some mention that she might have been pregnant, whether she was pregnant or not. She, I think she believed that she, this person loved her as much as she loved them and that they were going to have a life together. And in her mind, um, when she went there that night, that she discovered that this wasn't real, and she became very upset. Now, that's probably when there was uh, a struggle, a physical altercation took place. Whether she swung out at them or whatever doesn't matter, but the bottom line is there was a um, physical altercation, and I think she struck her head on... Uh, on something such as a fireplace, something hard, something immovable, and that's what happened. Either that or they were in the throes of a romantic interlude, and she, or uh, sexual interlude, and she, she he had, a, had her corset string around her neck. Now, this is the other, another way of looking at that. And her corset string, which she had pulled loose from her body, um, from her corset, um, he had put that around her neck at first, just in, in, in play, and then tightened it. And my understanding is that in this place um, of, uh, I'm going to go back to him, what's his name again? Ramrod. Yes, that he, um, his, just, let's just step away from this for a minute. He, there was, there was claims of women screaming and different things happening, whether it was at his lodge or his house, I'm not sure, but he, there's different reports of that over the years and that he was, it was thought that he was doing very strange things with women. Now, I believe that uh, as he was tightening that around her neck, that may well have uh, brought on like where she went unconscious. He freaked out and was trying to move her and maybe hit her head either on purpose or not um, to get that am amount of um, 
a strike, you would think it had to be intentional. And then he dragged her body to, to say, a wagon or a cart, and then took her off, which I imagine they had horse and carriage back then, a and a horse, yeah. horse-drawn wagon, and took her off to the lake. Now, taking her out to that lake was out of the way. It, she wasn't going to be found for, uh, for a while. Um, but he staged her gloves and her hat. Yeah. Um, he was putting her in her... See, in her mind, she was the living rich lady now. And in his mind, she was just a pauper. And I think he put her back... In staging her hat and her gloves, like he did... I believe that he was saying, there now, you're where you belong. You were never part of of my life. You know, you were never part of my social inner circle. You were not it. And I think that was kind of like his last message to her. Um, yeah. Okay. I want to thank Miss Kelly for being on the show tonight. We will be speaking to her, her again very soon. A special thanks to our listeners for tuning in, for you all are so kind. I have a quote for our listeners. Keep your face always towards the sunshine and shadows will fall behind you. Walt Whitman. Always remember, folks, that if you ever get bored with nothing to do, well, take a walk deep into the woods. You might be surprised at what you might find. That's the end of our MJA podcast, the series, Cases from the Deep Freezer. This has been Episode 8, Part 6, The Unsolved Murder of Hazel Drew. My name is Mark. I was your host for tonight's show. And joining me was our co-host, Miss Callie. We say to all of you, good night from... Plattsburgh, New York. Thank you.